Just wishing you a tremendous mazel tov, Rabbi Kasher, on the publication of your Parsha Nut, with a play on Parsha Nut, um, this, this beautiful and, uh, and intricate study of our weekly Torah portion. You've been offering this to our community since we went to Zoom a few years ago, every single week. And I have heard countless times from so many people in our community and really representing every kind of person, every kind of student, just recently in bringing someone to the Beit Din for conversion, one of the things that they spoke about as a new Jew was how deeply meaningful and, and insightful your Parsha class has been for them. And, and I just, before you speak today, I just want to say a word to you about, about what I've witnessed and experienced in you as a teacher. And, and I know so many in this room are already nodding. To be a student of Rabbi David Kasher uh, is to be invited into the most beautiful journey of text and tradition. It's to have encounter with Jewish ideas that you may have never heard about, and if you've heard about them, you thought they were completely irrelevant to your life, and then to discover you don't know how you lived without them. <laughs> it's to be treated with dignity and care and respect in whatever part of your journey of learning you are in. It's to listen and learn with awe at the masterful way that you, Rabbi Kasher, draw upon texts and ideas from every corner of our tradition and, and somehow weave them together in a way that brings us along into that complexity and that depth. And, uh, and, and to know that we are learning with really one of the greatest teachers of our time. Um, so it's, uh, without further ado that I, I invite up the, uh, the author of the number one new release in the Torah category. <laughs> and and the number two bestseller, just ahead of the JPS Tanakh. So, uh, Rabbi David Kasher. Oh my gosh. By the way, I'm number one in, in Old Testament uh, cr criticism and, 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 and commentary as well, so. <laughs> I'm a star, I'm a star. <laughs> Um, yeah, my goodness. Thank you so much for that, Rabbi Tzadok. It's, uh, I, uh, yeah. Uh, really good to our <laughs> All right. Um, it, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an honor and a joy to be able to celebrate the release of this book w with Ikar, with my home, home community here. And, um, and it's an opportunity to thank you all for your support. Um, this book this book grew out of a, a, a writing project, a blog that um, I knew I would no longer be able to keep up. It was like weekly writing. It sort of took over my life. But once I got this job, I realized I had to um, leave it behind. But, but Ikar has just been so um, supportive in this. Uh, since then, I've been working on trying to get this out. And um, your Rabbi Browse gave me this beautiful blurb on the back. And, um, and all of my colleagues have been, you know, constant... Chevruta to me. Hannah Jensen did a did an edit for me. I appreciate you, but 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 mostly I I, I appreciate you all just for being a, a community that I'm able to to learn with to learn with every week. It, it believe me, I get more out of it than you do. I I it is the center of my life that that Parsha class. I just I, this is the central rhythm of my life, and if nothing else, I want to recommend it to you. This this rhythm. We have lots of rhythms in this tradition. The most famous, of course, being Shabbat. And the Parsha, the weekly Parsha, is a way that we, we, we build on that weekly rhythm by following our story, our shared, our collective story. Um, so I've been working on getting it out, you know, for the last few years, and it's always been somewhere in the back of my mind, a little anxiety. And so now that the book is out, it, uh, it, one thing that it is, is just a relief, like it's, it's done. Um, but now that it is out, you're supposed to you know, trot it around and, t and talk about it. And that feels a little strange. I mean, you know, because it's, as I, as someone just published a book is nodding, Rabbi Scheinlein. Um, it's written, you know, so that's where it is. Like, I don't, you know, why, why, do, I, why do I just read it, you know? Uh, my brother is a comedian. And, um, you know, when, they, when you put out a special as a comedian, you put it in an hour, it's like, it's understood you're retiring that material. You know, you're never going to tell those jokes again. Just watch the, the special. Um, so it's funny to, to then start talking about what's in here, but also 
this space and Shabbat here together as we gather together, it's not the time for a, for a book reading, right? That's, that's not what we do. So instead, uh, I'll share some Torah that, that you can find in here, um, and, um, and maybe, you'll, maybe you'll want to read more. But, um, but this book, I think more than anything else, I'm happy that it's out because it, it is an excuse. It gives me an excuse to talk about um, this particular tradition that I love so, so much, this, this genre of Jewish literature called Parshanut. Parshanut, uh, it's a play, right? Parshanut, Parshanut. But um, Parshanut means, um, means the, the study of the weekly Parsha or just Torah commentary. It just refers to the genre um, of, of our tradition of just writing commentary on the Torah that's been going on since, since the days of the Talmud in, in the form of, uh, of Midrash. And um, I discovered it when I, when I discovered this book, this is a, this is a Mikraot Gedolot, and the way it works is the text of the Torah is up on top, and then all of these, uh, all of these texts around are different rabbis throughout the centuries who are offering their interpretations and sometimes debating with one another. It's a real, you, you open this book and you're suddenly in a conversation. And that's one of the things I love about it so much. It's like, it's being able to listen in on a conversation that's been taking place across centuries. And you meet some of the most interesting people and you hear some of the wildest things. So the biggest name in this conversation is Rashi, right? Some of you have heard of Rashi, but, uh, but today, you know, I wrote a book, so I got to do a little bit of a deeper cut. So I, I want to talk today about the, the second biggest or most classic name in, in this tradition, which is Rabbi Abraham Ibn Ezra, or the Ibn Ezra, we call him, the Ibn Ezra. And um, he was surely one of the, the most eclectic and fascinating figures in, in, in Jewish history. Um, when actually, when they first, when they, the first rabbinic Bible, they called it, right? The first Mikrot Gedolot um, who, who was published in the 1500s by Daniel Bomberg, also the first printer of the, of the Talmud. And it just had the text of the Torah, and then on one side it had Rashi, and the other side it had the Ibn Ezra, this, this other guy. And that made for a great contrast, because Rashi's a col- Rashi is a collector of earlier rabbinic interpretation, earlier midrash, and so his commentary can be kind of wild, fantastic, full of wordplay and imaginative storytelling. And the Ibn, Ibn Ezra's commentary, by contrast, a- appears very different. It's it's much more literal readings, what we call the pshat, based on grammar and semantics, very careful linguistic approach. And also, it's very clear, once you're reading him, that the man has the entire Bible just at his fingertips, just, just, just there, right? Didn't need the internet. Um, so so he is, uh, he's, uh, he's, the, he's the one you go to for the pshat reading, the straightforward reading. But the truth is, the Ibn Ezra... Uh, does a lot more than just simple readings. Um, He was uh, uh, born in in, in 11th century Spain and uh, distinguished himself as a poet, was well known as a poet, but he has been described as a polymath, meaning like knows all kinds of things, because he wrote works of philosophy and astronomy and mathematics. Um, He also is a man who had a very hard life, who lived through a a lot of illness and, and poverty, lost uh, several of his children. And uh, in 1137, uh, for reasons we don't know, but maybe one of those reasons, he began, and this is the most fascinating thing about him, he began three decades of traveling. He traveled around, traveled around Europe and, and, um, and, and east of that, and uh, he would support himself uh, by... Uh, through, through, through donations from wealthy patrons who would pay him to write poetry or commentary. Like, imagine being that good at poetry, that people would just pay you a lot of money to write, to write poetry. Um, but here's, 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 I think, the really critical point about all of his traveling, is that as a consequence of being unrooted in any one community, he was a, 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 an independent thinker. He was a, a particularly independent thinker. He had no ties to any particular communal standard, and so he often is willing to say what nobody else will. 
Um, for example, he talks about traveling around from place to place and noting, noticing differences in the, in the Torah scrolls um, from country to country. There are little variations in words, which is a kind of heresy. Right? It would suggest that the, maybe we don't have the exact text exactly right. Um, and in fact, uh, Judaism's favorite heretic, Baruch uh, Spinoza, used Ibn Ezra as an example of, of textual criticism. He calls him the earliest of, of, the, of what we would call biblical critics. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration because he really was a, a pious man, very, very traditional in many ways. But, and, and here's where he becomes a real rebel. He is willing to read the Torah as it is, without the filter of earlier centuries of rabbinic interpretation. And in doing that, sometimes he comes to shocking and unique interpretations. And he does just that this week in the story of Migdal Bavel, the Tower of Babel. Um, and and I, I wrote about it in this book. Um, it, the Tower of Babel is, is, is just incredible, uh, first and foremost, because it is nine lines long. Nine lines long, right? It, it's, a, it's a story that is imprinted on not just our culture, world consciousness, right? We have, uh, we have a word, Babel, to Babel. Right, that comes from this story, and movies have been made about it, and paintings have been painted about the Tower of Babel. Um, so the story is that after the flood, after the, the flood that we, were, that we were hearing about today, um, the descendants of Noah uh, gathered together to build a tower um, with its, its head in the sky, Rosh Hashanah. And God seems disturbed, so God confounds their speech and then scatters them across uh, the, the world. It's sometimes seen as, a, as, a, as an etiology. Like, how, how is it that we got so many different languages? Oh, ta- the Tower of Babel, that's, that's how. Um, but what's the problem? Like, why is God so upset? I mean, it's just a building. It's a big, tall building. I mean, is it, what, 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 what is disturbing God so much? So the Torah uh, itself gives an answer. In verse 4, um, uh, the, the Torah says that they, the people said to one another, come, come, let's build a city and a tower with its, with its head in the sky, shem, and we'll make a name for ourselves. We'll make a name for ourselves. So this was a, this was a glory project, right? This was the human desire for achievement and the prestige that it brings. And, and so it becomes a kind of a moral tale, right? It's self, that sort of craven and unfettered self-promotion will eventually be humbled by, by, by forces greater, greater than you. Um, and the rabbinic interpretation, the classic rabbinic interpretation, which Rashi quotes, builds on this. Bereshit Rabbah, the Midrash says, they built a tower, but they didn't just build a tower, they had an idol on top with a sword in its hand so that they can do a, a milchama, a war against God. So they, could, they, were, they were fighting a war against God. There's another Midrash that says actually that they said to one another, let's go grab hatchets and we'll go and we'll strike God, which is sort of a ridiculous and, 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 and also terrifying image. It's some kind of, who, you going to murder God, hit God. So there's some kind of rebellion going on here. Maybe they're angry about the flood, right? We, we don't know what their motivations are exactly, but, but, but we have, we're forced to think who were these people? What, what were they thinking? And we, we can imagine them, as the Midrash does, as sort of obsessive, self-centered, proud, violent, selfish, and idolatrous, you know, barbarians. But the Ibn Ezra, just reading the text of the Torah carefully, identifies some other characters in the crowd. I'll, I'll, don't, don't be surprised, he says, that Noah and his son Shem were there, there as part of the crowd. He, he's a mathematician, right? So he just does the simple math, and Noah was said to live for like 900 and something years. Um, and so he must have been present there. Noah was at the building of the Tower of Babel. Well, what does that mean? But if we think about it, maybe Noah was traumatized. Maybe he was angry with God. Maybe that does make some sense. But then the Ibn Ezra calls out another familiar figure there in Babel, and this one comes as a real shock. Haya Avraham mi bone hamigdal. Abraham was one of the builders 
of the tower. Hayavraham mibonei hamigdal. You see this in here and you're just, your mind explodes. Abraham, Abraham, our forefather, the, the one who walked before God, the model of perfect faith, the founder of nations of believers, was building the Tower of Babel? It's, it's unthinkable. And what did he, he wanted to make a name for himself? Or could we even imagine him going to war with God, hatchet in hand? And what, what would we do with this image? Well, one of the things that we can do with it is, is, is to provide an answer to one of the great, great questions, maybe, maybe the biggest question in this tradition of Parshanut, which always starts with questions. And one of the great questions is, why Abraham? Why? Why did God tap Abraham? What comes out of nowhere? Go. You're the one. Why? Why was it Abraham? And most of the answers given by the tradition are that Abraham was a spiritual prodigy. He just knew somehow he tapped into things that nobody else could see. He smashed his father's idols, right, in the, in the, in the most famous story. He always knew and he always believed. But this image, the image that the Ibn Ezra gives us, allows us to imagine Abraham's story as one that starts not with faith, but with doubt. You know, what if Abraham came to be a servant of God only after years of rejecting God? of mocking God, of fighting God? What if Abraham, like everyone around him, was once a heretic? This reading offers a, an entirely new vision of Abraham's story because he wasn't the golden child. He wasn't the enlightened one. He never smashed his father's idols. Maybe he worshiped them. It's a shocking reading, but in some ways, I think it offers us an Abraham that many of us can relate to. An Abraham that knew what it was like to rage against God, to, to doubt God, to question God, as so many of us do. But he struggled through it, and he came out with faith. A faith that was even stronger for the struggle. These are the sorts of readings that are made possible by the deep study of Torah commentary. It's not the only way to view this story, but that's just the point. There are multiple narratives that emerge from the same tradition, some much more radical than we're used to hearing. And one of my purposes in writing this book was to show that this tradition is wilder and bolder and stranger and more complex than we're used to thinking about. We are, in this tradition, interpreters. We carry a story and we interpret it. And interpretation, parshanut, is a powerful tool that can take you almost anywhere. But you have to be grounded in the text. You have to be grounded in the story. The Ibn Ezra didn't just say this because he thought it was a wild thing to say. He said it because he was deep, deep, deep in the Torah. And he knew the Torah like the back of his hand. And he added things up and he figured things out and he spent all of his days contemplating. You can be an interpreter. Everybody, everybody is welcome to be an interpreter of this story, of this tradition. But you need two things in order to do it right. You need knowledge and you need love. Ibn Ezra had so much knowledge that I stand in awe of him, but he also clearly had so much love for this Torah. And I hope, I hope that this book brings a little bit of knowledge to the world, a little more knowledge of this tradition to the world, but more than anything, I hope that this book contributes to the growth of Ahavat Torah, of the love of Torah. If it does that, even a drop, I will have considered it a success. I'm so grateful to you all. Thank you so much.